So last year, we did a six-month TV fast. Uh, actually, it started off as a three-month TV fast, but then we stretched it out into six months. And it was a really interesting exercise that taught us a lot of things as a family. And it also kind of broke the internet when I talked about it online. So today, I want to chat about this decision and all of the things we learned from it in more of a long-form format, in case you missed it over on social media. And I think there'll be some really interesting takeaways for you um, if you have a family that tends to be a little bit more connected to their screens than you like. Welcome to Old Fashioned On Purpose. This is the show where we explore what we have left behind as we have raced towards progress as a society. And not only that, but how we can get the best parts back. I'm your host, Joe Winger, and we have been homesteading here out on the wide open Wyoming prairie since 2008. I love living this old fashioned life. And I especially love teaching other people just like you how to take these skills and weave them into your modern day to day and to get all of the benefits that comes with that. So this topic today is a little bit different. Um, it's not a tutorial. It's not an interview. I don't have anybody here with me. It's just me in my studio, but I think it fits really well into this idea of living old fashioned on purpose, because in essence, being an old fashioned on purpose person is about living in an intentional way, not just being someone who's carried along by the waves or the whims of culture, but you're thinking about what you're doing and you're making very intentional choices. And that is really the um, genesis of where this whole topic began in our family. So let me give you a little bit of backstory on this TV fast that has garnered way more attention than I thought it ever would. So in case you missed the post over on Instagram, I did one a couple weeks ago and then um, the big one last year. So no, we don't actually watch a lot of TV as a family to begin with. That's not something that's a huge part of our life. We don't have it on all the time. We don't even have um, like Dish Network or anything. We've just had the streaming options, Netflix, Hulu, et cetera. So we don't watch a lot, but traditionally my kids, since they were little, I would let them watch a show around four o'clock in the afternoon. Because if you have ever been a mom of young children, you know that is called the witching hour because everybody loses their ever loving minds at that time of day. And you're tired and they're tired or they just woke up from a nap and they're out of sorts and you're trying to make supper. And it's just not the greatest time of day when you're a mom of little kids. So we had made this tradition that they could watch a show or a cartoon when I would prep supper. It worked great. And we all looked forward to it. So, you know, fast forward a decade or more and they're older. Um, the witching hour is no longer an issue for us because, you know, they're, they're not babies and toddlers anymore. But we were still maintaining that four o'clock TV time. Not all bad, right? But it was something they really just like kind of fixated on throughout the day. Um, also, sometimes in the evenings, primarily on weekends, but um, sometimes weeknights too, if we were tired or just had a really long day, we would watch a show as a family. Usually documentaries were super nerdy like that, um, but we'd watch various documentaries or things like that um, just after supper or before bed. Um, or whatever. Again, not a ton of TV. We didn't sit around all day watching, but it was just something we did occasionally. What started to happen last fall, um, so that would be 20, oh my goodness, 2022, I guess. No, yes, 2022. <laughs> um, we had so much going on. We were starting to just feel burned out on life. And so we were leaning on the TV watching a little bit more than we had prior to that. So, you know, we just found, okay, well, I'm tired tonight. Let's watch a show. Oh, right. Let's watch a show the next night. And then, oh, I'm also tired this other night. So let's watch a show here. So we were just like doing it more and more. And it started to feel like it was kind of like becoming our default activity instead of something special. And also, like I said, the kids were like kind of fixated on that four o'clock TV time where I'd see them start to taper back on their play or their creativity around three o'clock because they started to get antsy knowing that as soon as I did chores, then I can go do TV time. And it just like, I just didn't like how it was um, kind of dominating their afternoons, at least the idea of it. So Christian and I looked at each other as we kind of started to realize our propensity towards letting TV become more of a focus than we wanted it to be. And we decided to do something a little bit drastic. And we decided that uh, starting in December of 2022, we would stop watching TV for three months. Now, in Wyoming, 
Deciding to do this in the winter is an especially big deal because our winter nights are long and dark. And so summertime is not an issue as much. We don't even really watch TV in the summer or outside, but you know, it gets dark at 4.30 or whatever, and we have wind and snow. And so it's easy to tuck around the TV in the winter evening. So deciding to do that um, from December through March or February was a big deal because it was like, wow, we're going to have all these winter evenings with no TV entertainment. And so we knew it was drastic, but we decided, you know, if we wait and put it off until spring, we're probably not going to do it. So you just got to do it uh, when you feel called towards it. And that applies to so many things. Take action now, right? And then deal with the, the difficulties later. Um, we also decided to take a break off of iPads. Like our kids have iPads mostly for school stuff, homeschool research and things. They also would listen to some um, programs at night when they're falling asleep. But we decided to also fast from the iPads. Um, and we did decide that Christian and I would continue to use our phones, not for random mindless scrolling, but I do run my business off my phone. Like there's things we need on the phone. So we kept the phones. Our kids do not have phones, uh, smartphones. Um, and so we did no iPads, no TV and limited phone. I say that because this will matter later in the story because the internet, the people of the internet rather had some um, issue to that, but I'll get to that later. So that was our plan. December 1st rolled around and off we went. Um, a lot of people have asked if our kids were devastated with this announcement. And I, you know, I didn't know how they would react when we sat them down and told them of this crazy idea. Um, I figured there would be some wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth, but there actually, there wasn't. Um, and it was surprising. And I'm not just saying that to make myself look good publicly, but truly they weren't that upset. We told them why we were doing it. We told them, you know, we don't think TV is bad. We just feel like it's starting to dominate our time together as a family. And that's not a good thing. And we started to just share with them some of our other ideas of things we could do instead on our winter evenings. And um, during that hour in the afternoons when they would usually be watching their four o'clock TV time. So when we presented it to them like that, they were curious, they weren't horribly devastated. And they're like, okay, cool, we'll try it. And I think it helped that, you know, mom and dad were also doing it as well. We were also making that sacrifice. So uh, we kicked it off. And I think our initial plan is that we were going to be reading more in the evenings as a family, which truly isn't that much of a sacrifice, right? When the fire's rolling um, and it's cold outside, it's it feels good. It's cozy to sit around the fire. We also started this tradition of we had some oil um, lamps in our living room for decoration, but they were also functional. We just didn't use them very much. And so we would kind of created this routine or tradition where we'd light the oil lamps and get the fire going. And sometimes I'd make tea or hot chocolate, or we'd have a special treat like cookies or brownies. And then we'd all get our books and our blankets and the dogs would pile on top of us. And we'd all just sit around the fire in the living room and read. Um, and that was just really honestly a blast. And it, we found that we were getting into more books that we were picking at, you know, that we were slowly making our way through. Well, now we were making actual progress in those books because TV wasn't um, distracting us from them. So that was our first um, activity. And then, you know, you do that so many nights a week. You, for us, we needed something else. It wasn't quite enough for us to read books in the evening seven nights a week. So Christian decided that it would be a really good time for him and the kids to start learning how to do some leather craft. Our son had got a um, leather kit, like a Tandy leather kit, for Christmas. And my daughter had got a little kit on how to braid rawhide for Christmas. And so we decided, you know, those are fairly not, not complicated, but it takes some effort and some parental oversight to help them figure out kind of where to start. And so we're like, this is the perfect time. So uh, Christian worked with them on getting the leather stuff set up out in the shop um, with stamping and tooling and sewing. And my daughter and I were working on deciphering how to braid the rawhide, which her, honestly her brain is way better at that than I am. I just get very overwhelmed by all the instructions. So they worked on that. Um, that transitioned into Christian, not only enjoying helping my son and daughter with that, but then he started to 
say, hey, I think I, I actually like leather. I, I think I want to make some leather. I want to do something creative. And so he started making belts and he started playing around with stamping and doing all that. Um, some other things we did, um, the kids would do a lot of art projects. So we found them doing that a lot in the evenings or that would take the place of their four o'clock TV time. Um, another fun thing is we'd had this chess game. I think I had got it for a birthday present at some point. It's called No Stress Chess. It's super cheap, just like a $20 board game. And they played it a little bit, but kind of ignored it. Well, they pulled that out. And this, I know how to play chess, but like very, very sparingly. But this game has cards and it, it teaches them the moves and the sequences. And so they basically taught themselves how to play chess. And then that chess game stayed on our kitchen uh, table for months. And then every time we'd have someone over for lunch, like the kids would challenge the friend to a game of chess. And so chess became like their new thing. Uh, again, self-motivated. I didn't have to teach that or prompt that necessarily, but they just became inspired to tackle that on their own. Um, they also played outside a lot more. Um, they were more engaged in the homestead. Like, again, they were outside already. I had people online really criticize this or like, oh, well, you know, you had couch potato kids and now they suddenly realize they have a farm. And I'm like, no, they, they, they were outside and active prior to that because we still were limiting TV and screens. But just when there wasn't that fallback of screen time for their brains to fixate on, they engaged more deeply in the world around them. And I think that's also what we as adults do when we don't have a phone to tap and check and distract us, our brains are able to settle more deeply into the real world that's right in front of our face and the people that are right in front of us and the relationships. And so um, that was really neat to see them just become more engaged and more interested. Um, so that was, that was our, our fast results initially. And as we got through um, December and then January and February, we were nearing the end of our three months and Christian and I and the kids as well, were kind of like, we don't, we don't want to quit. Like this is, this is kind of fun. We kind of like the feeling of um, the dopamine we're getting from doing these more healthy, beneficial activities versus that kind of cheap, quick dopamine you get from sprawling on the couch, being a couch potato every night. And so we decided to extend it. We went for a full six months. I think actually we went a little bit longer than that before we finally um, decided to turn the TV back on. And honestly, when the time came, it was last summer when we finally turned it back on. It wasn't like this grand, like, oh my gosh, this feels so good to have it back on. It was very much like, eh, do you want to watch a show? I don't know. Do you? I guess. Maybe. Let's see if there's a documentary. It was kind of like that. It was like, it wasn't even missed as much as I thought we would miss it. So um, it was all in all a really good exercise for us. And I think some of my biggest conclusions from this were that I don't believe TV is inherently evil. I know there's a lot of people who do. I, there's a lot of bad, nasty, gross things on TV that are completely a waste of brain space to consume. Um, but I don't think inherently every show is bad. It will rot your brain. But what I worry about with TV, both in myself and in my kids, is what healthy, beneficial, creative activities is TV displacing, right? What's it taking the place of? And that was really the lesson from this fast for us was that, you know, um, we were watching doc documentaries. Uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't just trash TV, but man, the life skills and the joy and the connection that we got from making leather together or reading books together or cooking something together, that was so much more meaningful and healthy and beneficial to us in the long run than watching those documentaries every single night as a family. Um, and so again, TV isn't always bad. There can be benefits to enjoying it on occasion, but it's no substitute for real world lived experience um, and actually doing the thing yourself instead of just watching people do it on a screen. Okay, so that was kind of part one of the fast. And to this day, we're still like we we are watching TV on occasion. We still haven't um, implemented the four o'clock TV time for the kids. I asked them at one point if they wanted to, to roll that back into their schedule and they're like, eh, I don't think we need to do that. So um, they're good with that. And we are occasionally watching shows on the weekends together in the evenings, but that's about it. I predict that once spring and summer really hits full swing, 
we'll be closing the doors on our living room TV. We have these barn doors that go over it and I bet we don't open again for quite some time. Um, all right, so that was kind of part one, right? Part two of this interesting thought experiment happened when I shared this in a reel last year. Um, I think it was early spring, late winter of 2023. And I just thought, hey, this is kind of interesting. I think people might find this helpful. So I shared that just basically what I just explained to you today, but I did it in a short form video uh, format. And it was fascinating. So my audience, folks like you, right, thought it was great, thought it was interesting. Hey, I want to try that. This is interesting. Um, and then for some reason that I'll never understand, the video went viral. It ended up garnering over 10 million views on Instagram, which is a blessing and a curse. Because when something goes viral, you attract a whole lot of people who are not in your audience, who don't get you um, and really don't understand anything about who you are or what you do. So I found out that this topic makes the uh, entirety of the internet quite angry. <laughs> Not my homestead audience. They weren't angry at all. But the rest of the world didn't like this. And so it was interesting to watch the comments roll in. I had I had people saying everything from like, I'm a horrible mom, um, to that uh, we're privileged because um, we don't have a TV, which I didn't really understand that because I kind of feel like, you know, TV subscriptions are expensive. So I'm like, well, we're, we're reading books and like, you know, playing with Play-Doh and crayons. I'm like, oh, that's privilege. But anyway, that was a whole nother topic that was confusing. Um, I had a lot of folks say that if I don't let my kids watch educational TV, they'll be stunted for life. And I'm like, well, you know, they watch some educational TV when we're not doing a TV fast. But I think there's also other ways to learn information, like, I don't know, books or, I don't know, doing the thing in real life. I think those are also ways to <laughs> get education. So it was, it was fascinating. Um, to see the comments roll in. But the one that I, I want to address today, because I feel like this is a common theme for a lot of parents, and one that I hear a ton every time I talk about this, is parents say, oh, I want to do this, but my kids would freak out if I took away the video games, or they would freak out if I took away the TV, and I just don't know how that would work. I don't know how to do it. Do you have any advice? So here are some thoughts for you if you're in that um, category. So. I think the first thing that I would recommend is if you're going to do this, you need to have your family kind of enrolled in the idea, enrolled in the process. Explain to them why um, you're doing what you're doing. I find with my kids, anytime we live our lives in a way that's different from the status quo, um, which is most of the time, the best way that I can help them feel like they're a part of the idea process and not just a victim of it is to tell them why we're doing it. You know, if we eat differently, if we're not having um, cans of pop like their friends every single day, like why? So we, I, I share research with them enough that their, you know, brains can handle at their ages. And I share why we think that, you know, not having pop every day, for an example, is better for us. I, we talk about how it's not always bad if you want a soda. You know, that's a, that's okay. But like why, what it does to your blood sugar and what it does to your metabolism and all that. So whenever we're doing something different that feels countercultural, that might make my kids question my sanity, <laughs> I try to enroll them in the process. So I think that's number one. That's key. And that's what we did with TV. We talked about screen time, um, really not being beneficial for our brains. We talked about how it gets you hooked on a dopamine in a really kind of cheap, quick way versus the dopamine that comes from when you create. And my kids are very familiar with that sort of dopamine because every time they make something, whether it's cookies in the kitchen or they've created a new craft or a new drawing, I'm always calling that out. I'm like, oh, how does that feel? And I'm like, oh, I feel so good because I made something. And I'm like, well, why do you think that is? And they're like, well, because it was hard for a little while. And I didn't know if I was going to get to do it. And then I figured it out. And now I feel amazing. And so I, I want them to start listening to those cues in their body to when they know that, hey, this is my brain rewarding me for persevering and having resilience and having creativity. And I, I honestly, I'm honestly trying to hook them on that dopamine versus the dopamine that comes from a video game or scrolling or just watching Netflix um, and being a consumer, right? So that's what I'm, I'm always doing. And so when I started to explain this idea of taking a break from TV, not forever, not because TV's evil, not because we're being, you know, extremists, but I'm like, hey, let's reset our brains. Let's reset our dopamine. Like, let's figure, let's kind of retrain our brains to get the hap the good dopamine, the dopamine and the happy chemicals from the creation process instead of the consumption process. They were like, oh, okay, makes sense. She's been talking about this for a while. So let's give it a try. 
So I think that was the first step. I recognize that not all kids are in that same place. And some of them are going to not, you know, necessarily agree with that decision. And this is where my advice maybe gets a little bit stickier, uh, a little bit more controversial, because I would say, um, you're still the parent, right? You still are making the decisions for the child. And I know there's lots of parenting styles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I would say if you're, if you see your kids becoming so dependent on screens or iPads or video games that you're worried about it having a detrimental effect on their, uh, adulthood, like as, it's our job as parents to put a stop to that. We can't stop that once they're an adult, but we can do something about it now. And so I would say, um, do your best to get them enrolled. But then at some point you may have to go, you know what, guys, we're just not going to do video games for this month or this week or this period and, you know, let them work through those feelings of feeling upset, feeling disappointed, and just let them work through that. Don't try to rescue them from that process. And it might not be pretty. There might be some yelling or some crying or some um, tantrums, and that's okay. I mean, stick with your guns, stick with your decision. You know why you're doing it. You know it's going to be beneficial for them in the long run and see what happens. And I know, again, that's controversial, but that's what I do with with my kids. You know, if they had had a meltdown over that, I would have let them have the meltdown. But my answer would still be the same. We're still going to do a TV fast because I think this is what we need at this point. And that's my prerogative as a parent. Um, so that's why I would handle that. And it's tricky to explain that in a Facebook comment or an Instagram comment, which is why I wanted to talk about it today. But I think that's really important because as parents, we do have a bird's eye view that our kids um, don't often have when their brains are still developing. And, you know, the more research I see around screens and children, especially social media and children, it scares the heck out of me um, with how it's rewiring their brains. Um, it's not good. And when you hear the experts talk about it, um, it's, it's pretty alarming, in fact, what we're doing to our kids. And I don't think we fully understand the ramifications long term of having kids hooked on screens the way they are in our culture. So it's a good thing to take a break. And it, the break doesn't have to be forever. That was the other piece that I think um, the internet missed when they were so angry at me. As I said, it was a TV fast. <laughs> Wasn't a TV, you know, blow it up, beat it with a baseball bat, whatever, throw it out the window. We just took a break for a while. Um, I think that's a good way to not turn into to the extremes on either end, right? I think moderation is good. I think nuance is good. There are cool programs on TV. There's programs that my kids have learned things from. Um, we were reading our history in homeschool the other day, and I said something, I can't even remember, the War of 1812, and my son was like, oh, yeah, I remember we watched this about that battleship in this documentary, and I'm like, oh, see, it's not all bad, right? There are good parts. Um, so I think defining as a fast instead of this indefinite exercise goes a really long way um, in helping them go, okay, we can do anything for a while. I can do anything for a short period of time. And your fast can even be a week to start. And then you kind of realize, hey, I'm not going to die if I don't have the phone or the TV. And then you can eventually stretch it out. Um, the other cool thing about kids and adults that I think that a lot of people don't realize is that when our brains have blank space, they have a little bit of margin, they have a little bit of the good kind of boredom, we get creative. In fact, boredom is a clue to our brains that it's time to um, switch states. It's time to change what we're doing. It's time to try something different. Boredom isn't always bad. Um, and if your kids, you know, the first day of the fast or the second day of the fast are like, I'm bored, you can say, awesome. Now you have the ability to come up with creative ways to fill that space. And I find that when kids break out of the habit, which can sometimes be painful at first, they have to almost go through a withdrawal period. And so do we sometimes as adults. But when we go through that withdrawal period and our brain finally kind of unlocks, then we can fill that empty space with all the good stuff. And I think one of the greatest joys I have as a parent is watching my kids be creative and watching them fill their afternoons with things. When I'm standing back, when I, I'm not micromanaging, I'm not giving ideas. If you have my book, Old Fashioned on Purpose, and you've read that chapter, um, the kids chapter, I talk about this a lot. It's not up to you as the parent to necessarily provide them with an itinerary of their play that day. In fact, if you do that, you're going to squash all the good things um, that come from that because 
think about how you become interested in something. It's usually when it's of your own accord. It's not because you have a teacher or a boss or an authority figure standing over you saying, you have to like this. You have to want to do this. Here, let me do half of it for you and you finish. Like that's not, just not how our humans, human brains work. Um, so let your kids find that spark of what interests them and let them chase that. And they're only going to do that though when they have that little bit of boredom to jumpstart that process. Um, just in the past couple of weeks, you know, my kids, we do school in the morning and then they usually have afternoons to have free time, play outside, do whatever they want to do. That's always how we've operated. Just in the last week, they, my son has made a watch band. He came out to his leather tools and he spent the entire afternoon. He took, he had a broken, um, watch band on his old watch. He took it apart. He moved the buckles over. He figured out how to cut a new one. Um, he, he figured out his buckle, his first buckle iteration wasn't very good. So then he problem solved all on his own and he came in and brought it into the house like three hours later. And he talked about it. He's not a big talker, but he talked about that thing for like 20 minutes solid. Cause he was so excited. And he showed me all the things he did and all his thought processes of how he had to do this buckle this way and this pin this way and how he had to cut it. And oh, this part was too thick. So we had to use this leather. And I'm just like, this is priceless. I, number one, didn't have to facilitate that. Number two, his brain made all sorts of connections there that he's going to start to strengthen as, as he does it more and more. And these are the life skills that make me as a parent just so excited. He wouldn't be able to do that if he was distracted by the video games. Um, another silly example, my kids do stuff like this a lot, and it's nerdy, but I love it. Um, I got a steam cleaner machine this past week, the kind that um, heats up steam in a little pot and then it has different attachments and my shower is super gross. So I wanted something to get all the soaps come off and among other things. And so my kids are always super interested by it with gadgets and my son often treats them like a, a Lego set where he gets, he wants to put them all together and read the instructions, which makes me thrilled because I hate doing that stuff. Um, so I got the steam cleaner out and we were, he was helping me put it together and he was analyzing the attachments and where everything goes. And then they watched me use it and they're like, we want to use it. <laughs> we want to use the steam cleaner because it looks so fun. And it actually kind of is fun to use. It's very satisfying. So we talked about steam. They were well aware steam is hot because, um, they use the teapot and they know my instant pot and how it works. So they're, they're well acquainted with safety and steam, but I, we showed them how to, to turn it on and wait for it. And, you know, don't, don't open this when it's hot. And, you know, this is the safety pieces. And then my kids like use the steam cleaner and had a ball for like an hour. They washed all sorts of things and it wasn't an assignment. It wasn't a chore, but it was just the joy of curiosity. And I see that happen a lot. Um, when we just let the kids have that little bit of free time. And I'm a little, I'm a little bit on a rabbit trail now, but um, I'm really passionate about this because again, I, I don't think screens are bad. I use screens. I have internet-based businesses. I have social media accounts. I am well aware of the benefits of technology and I subscribe to those benefits. But I also know that as we are trying to become more intentionally old fashioned on purpose people, one of the most powerful things we can do is to take that powerful technology and purposely set it aside for times of our day and during our week and during our months so we can let our brains have that space to create. Um, and I think that's a really, really big deal. So that is my story of our TV fast. And I think we'll do it again uh, at some point. It's not really a temptation for us as much in the spring and summer, like I said, we're outside. Nobody wants to watch TV during those long, beautiful summer evenings. But I just wanna make sure we keep our tech in check as much as possible, especially with our kids, so they can learn to have a balanced relationship with it. Oh, one other little note. A lot of people who left comments, it was so funny. They thought they like caught me, right? Like I hadn't thought of this. They're like, aha, you said you did a TV fast, but you're recording. Um, your activities your kids are doing on your phone. I'm like, yes, wow, good catch. <laughs> so just how I split this apart for any of you who are thinking about doing this, but also maybe have to have a phone for your job or your business or whatever. Um, we did a TV fast. We called it a TV fast because we were fasting from TV. I think the internet didn't really understand that. Um, iPads fell into that, right? But I still used my phone for business and for social media and for keeping up with 
business things because that is crucial to our livelihood. You can decide though, if you do this sort of fast, what your boundaries are. Maybe you don't need your phone for business. It's just more of a pleasure thing and taking phone calls. And so there's different ways that you can set that up. Um, I know even though I use my phone for business, I always have it on silent. I think most people do these days. Like it's funny how we used to all think ringtones were such a cool thing. And now it's like someone's phone rings and we're like, oh, phones don't ring anymore. What are you thinking? Like, it's not a thing, right? Um, my phone's always on silent. I don't have certain apps on my phone. I do think that when you're creating on your phone, it's a little bit of a different dynamic than mindlessly scrolling. Uh, again, if you've got my book, Old Fashioned on Purpose, we talk about that in the technology chapter, how these apps and our phones are set up to operate like slot machines. And they are working with our brain's weaknesses of needing that quick dopamine and that quick um, hit of satisfaction. And so mindlessly scrolling and wait in refreshing the apps to see what's up next definitely is addictive. It's less addictive when you're creating, right? Because it takes that brain power. You still get dopamine from the process of creating a reel or a social post or something because for me, I always have that tension of like, oh, I want to, I want to make this thing, but I don't know how to do it. And I don't know what to say. And I have to work at it for a while. And it takes effort and it's a little bit uncomfortable. And then when I finally overcome that and post something I'm proud of or create something I'm proud of, then it feels really good. And that's, I think, a healthier type of dopamine um, production is when we're overcoming in in that creation process and then getting the fruit of our labor. So I think you have to have those boundaries. I know it's less addictive for me to create because it takes more brain power. It's something I have to have more discipline to do. So that's how I separated that. Um, The internet was hilarious though. They're like, oh, you're using a phone. I'm like, yes, Barbara, I am using a phone, but I didn't say I wasn't going to use the phone. So anyway, side note, but I hope you guys try it. And if you do, um, let me know, tag me on socials. If you're using a phone, if not, don't tag me, just stay off of social and stay off the, uh, the Instagram and the Facebook, but it was a worthwhile exercise for us. I hope it inspires you to do the same. Maybe, um, TV isn't the thing that's taking over for you. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's time for you to take a drastic measure, if you will, to take that out of your life for a while, maybe not forever, and just see how you cope, if you cope, and what you use to fill that time and see if that makes you feel better and it's more beneficial for your mental and physical health. So thanks for listening. um, And we'll catch up with you on the next episode of the Old Fashioned on Purpose podcast.